All right. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here today. And uh, I, I listened to the uh, tail end of the last talk, and I have to say that the work that you're doing is incredibly uh, interesting. Um, if you have a chance, um, come take a look at our webpage, um, Supporting a Safe and Respectful Workplace at Institutions that Receive NIH Funding. Um, there's a lot of information uh, here uh, that might be of interest to you. Um, I want to point out a statement that was made by uh, Francis Collins, the former director of the uh, NIH. At the most fundamental level, our mission is about respect of human life, uh, which should permeate all aspects of our lives and work. NIH is committed to ensuring a safe and respectful work environment at NIH and at the institutions that we fund, and will take action if a hostile work environment is affecting NIH-funded research. And essentially, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what exactly um, that means. Um, now, this has been um, an issue that primarily uh, came to light uh, to us uh, several years ago in the form of sexual harassment. Uh, the case on the left involving uh, Inder Firma from California, this was the headline, uh, former cancer biologist allegedly sexually harassed women uh, for decades. Uh, this uh, story first became known to us through the press. Uh, and we were not uh, aware of the fact that there were a number of problems that, that um, ha had already been in some ways or, or, or shape known. Um, and it put us in a very uh, difficult uh, situation. Now on the right is a, a more recent story that uh, came out a few months ago. Uh, and as we were dealing with that one, we were in a, in a different position um, than we were um, before. So Dr. Collins was very concerned um, about sexual harassment in the biomedical research workspace and uh, NIH's uh, seeming um, inability or unwillingness to uh, deal with it. I, I think the comment that was just made uh, before we started um, that um, a number of people who have been identified as harassers uh, were very well funded uh, and that uh, may have made them immune or seemingly uh, immune for, um, for a long time. So, so uh, we put together a, a working group um, of our advisory committee to the director. The NIH director has uh, their own advisory committee. Uh, this is uh, what we call a, a FACA committee. It's an official uh, federal government advisory uh, committee. And, and often when the, the committee needs to deal with difficult problems, they put together a working group. So they put together a, a diverse working group that worked for nearly a year um, on thinking about ways in which we could change the culture um, to end sexual harassment. There were uh, four overarching themes that came out in this report. Uh, one was transparency and accountability uh, in reporting of professional misconduct, especially sexual harassment, mechanisms for restorative justice, a safe, diverse, and inclusive uh, environment and system-wide change. I'm primarily going to talk about item one uh, because that is where uh, our office has been particularly um, active. Now, a critical part of, of this um, comes from our own grants um, policy statement. Uh, so the NIH grants policy statement, you, you could kind of think of this as being our, our policy Bible. Uh, but it's, it's more than just a statement. It's actually a term and condition um, of all NIH-funded uh, awards. Um, and in the grants policy statement, um, there is a line that says that NIH grants are subject to requirements intended to ensure that recipients handle their financial awards responsibly. NIH recipients are expected to provide safe and healthful working conditions for their employees and foster work environments conducive um, to high quality research. So I think a critical point here is that this is a term and condition of award that, uh, that, the, uh, that the environment is safe and conducive to high quality research. And if there is a, a situation where there is some form of harassment or, bullet, or bullying um, or, uh, or hostile work environment, that will have to wait, uh, that will have to, um, uh, would fall under this particular term and condition and it would potentially constitute a violation. All right, now, another critical part um, about how uh, our funding agency is set up is that we give awards 
to institutions. We do not give awards to scientists. So for example, we would give an award to Michigan State University. We, we would not give an award to a specific scientist. Uh, and so um, NIH makes an award to a domestic organization, or it could be a foreign organization, but it's primarily domestic. And uh, that then, uh, that organization in turn is responsible for designating uh, principal investigators or, or key personnel uh, on the grant. So this is a simple cartoon. The award goes to the organization. NIH interacts with the organization and has a formal business relationship with the organization as a funding steward. And then the organization in turn employs principal investigators or, or other senior key personnel, and they um, have a, a relationship with those personnel as an employment steward. Okay, so that, those are two critical background um, points here that um, we, uh, as, as a term and condition of all awards, NIH expects that the uh, recipients will, will create an environment which is safe and conducive to high quality uh, work. And the second um, is that we give our awards to institutions, not to individual scientists. So here are some of the recommendations that were made by, uh, by that committee. Uh, one is to create a parallel process to treat professional misconduct, including sexual harassment, as seriously as research misconduct. And this we have done. So this is a, a high level overview of how we handle um, various uh, allegations. We have now handled over 400 allegations related to different forms of harassment, um, sexual and otherwise. And that includes bullying, hostile work environment um, and retaliation. And I'm gonna go over those in a bit of detail um, in a little bit. But the, the general approach, whether we're dealing with research misconduct, harassment, fraud, foreign interference, a peer review, um, integrity violation, or, or any, any other kind of misconduct follows the same general uh, approach. Uh, we receive um, harassment complaints um, in three ways. Uh, one is through a mailbox. We set the mailbox up in February of uh, 2019. Uh, that now is, is a relatively, uh, relatively less important way in which we receive uh, input. The second is through a web form. The web form was set up in June of uh, 2019. Um, and that, that web form um, enables people to submit uh, notification to NIH of potential problems. They can do it in a way which is anonymous. Uh, they can identify who they are if they want to. Uh, obviously, if they do that, it makes it a lot easier for us to, uh, to communicate and to ask questions back and forth, uh, but they don't have to. And a number of the complaints that we receive are anonymous complaints. Sometimes those can be quite uh, valuable. And then the third way we learn about problems is through NIH staff. So uh, somebody will contact a, a member of our staff and let them know that there is a potential problem. So when we get um, an allegation, um, our office um, addresses a number of questions. Number one is that the allegation involves harassment. And in this case, we, we define harassment rather broadly. So it certainly would include bullying um, as, uh, as well as uh, retaliation, hostile work environment, um, as well as um, sexual harassment. A, a second question is, should the allegation be referred uh, elsewhere? Um, we do sometimes refer uh, allegations to our Office of Civil Rights and Department of Health and Human Services, um, but maybe uh, for whatever reason, it may be more appropriate to go to a, a different office or a different uh, unit of the federal government. The third question is, is whether the information is specific enough to proceed. Uh, we do receive some allegations that will go something like, Dr. Jones is a jerk. And that doesn't really help us. It's not particu particularly uh, actionable. Um, on the other hand, if we get a, a compl uh, complaint that says, Dr. Jones did X, Dr. Jones did Y, and um, these are objectively defined behaviors, that is, um, that's something that uh, we could potentially work with. Um, are we able to follow up to get needed additional details? When we receive an anonymous complaint, almost by definition, we, we can't. Um, if we do get a complaint from somebody who, who identifies themselves, um, then uh, we often will go back and forth with that person. And sometimes that involves phone calls uh, to get a better sense as to what's going on and, and what might be an appropriate uh, approach for us to take. 
are NIH funded grants involved? Um, this may seem obvious, but if NIH funded grants are not involved, then, uh, then it's out of our jurisdiction. Uh, and then finally, is the respondent involved in peer review service? Uh, we've had some difficult situations where um, somebody who's been identified is engaging in some form of professional misconduct, um, including harassment, was serving on peer review, uh, and that uh, this raised questions as to whether or not it was appropriate for NIH to allow that person to serve um, on uh, peer review. Now, the institutional responsibility is, is really key. Um, and so in June um, of 2020, uh, we issued uh, this notice, and uh, along with Carrie Wallinetz and Francis Collins, I, I co-authored um, an editorial that appeared in Science about our responsibility um, to combat um, sexual harassment. And so one of the um, key points here is that, let's say that a, uh, a scientist um, has been identified as uh, potentially having engaged in some form of professional misconduct, uh, they are subject to investigation by their institution. And the concern is serious enough that that particular scientist has been put on administrative leave. So now in that case, their employment status has changed uh, and they're not in a position to be able to conduct NIH funded work um, in a wholly unrestricted way like they were before. So in a case like that, and these kind of cases happen uh, reasonably often, um, then uh, we now uh, have instructed institutions to mention to us whether or not uh, that change um, is related to concerns about safety and their work environment, uh, for example, due to concerns about harassment, bullying, retaliation, or hostile working conditions. This is taken um, straight out of our, uh, of our guide notice. Uh, we expect the institutions to tell us that. I mean, sometimes somebody will, will, will go on leave for a period of time for a perfectly innocent reason. Um, like um, medical problems, and uh, maybe they, they are undergoing some form of surgery and, and will you know, we'll need three months to uh, recuperate. All right, so I want to share with you some data. Um, and uh, this tells you a little bit about what our experience has been. Um, we really started working on this in 2019. In 2018, we had um, 33 cases that we handled. 2019, which is when we opened up our mailbox, we opened up the, the website, um, and the uh, and the ACD, the Advisory Committee to the Director Working Group, was put together. Um, at that time, um, our caseload jumped from 33 to 110. Um, in uh, 2020, uh, we had about the same number. Now, remind you that in 2020, that was when the uh, pandemic kicked in, and in 2021, we had 162. Um, so that was a, a, a substantial uh, jump. Uh, at the rate that we're going right now in, in 2022, we're going to have about um, the same or, or maybe um, slightly more. Um, over time, uh, the proportion of cases um, in which the allegations are uh, focused solely on sexual harassment has gone down uh, from about half to uh, maybe about a third. Um, uh, some of the cases involve sexual harassment along with something else. So we're told that um, a particular respondent may have engaged in sexual harassment as well as some other kind of problematic um, behavior. Um, that number, that proportion has also gone down. And then what we call other, and other is mostly bullying, um, although it also includes uh, a description of a hostile work environment uh, or retaliation. Um, it could include some form of discrimination, uh, which is not sexual. Um, and so that, that has gone up, um, and now in 2021 represented almost half of our uh, cases. Um, a large proportion of the cases involve some form of media publicity. In other words, the fact that there's a problem has been reported somewhere um, in the media. Uh, and uh, only a minority of the cases that we get um, are coming in the form of a self-disclosure, uh, where let's say an institution on their own will tell us about a potential problem. So this tells you a little bit about um, our outcomes. So here we divide, this is uh, taken from 2018 through 2021. Uh, uh, it's a little over 400 uh, cases. Um, and so we, uh, we divide them up into those where the allegations are sexual harassment only, sexual harassment and something else, um, or only uh, something else. So about three quarters to 80% um, of the time, we will contact the institution um, and ask questions. Uh, the most often reason why we wouldn't contact the institution 
um, is because the information that we get is so nonspecific that we really don't know what, what to do with it. Um, the institutions in turn can choose whether or not to engage in a formal um, investigation. That happens about two thirds uh, of the time. And uh, we, we have found that depending upon the type of, uh, of allegation, anywhere from 20 to 35% of the allegations are substantiated. For sexual harassment, 35% of the allegations have been substantiated. Uh, and for, um, uh, for others, for, for non-sexual harassment, um, it's been uh, about 16%. Um, there are outcomes. Uh, sometimes uh, principal investigators are removed uh, from grants. Uh, sometimes there are other kinds of grant actions that are taken, um, such as um, additional oversight, additional monitoring, uh, climate surveys that are conducted by uh, external firms. Um, some cases, uh, the, um, as a consequence of the, uh, of the incident or the investigation, uh, the scientists will leave the institution. Um, that happens about 25 to 30% of the time. I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail because sometimes that creates some, some interesting and challenging problems. And then we have removed a substantial number from peer review. We have a fairly low threshold to take somebody um, off of peer review. Um, NIH advise people to serve on peer review solely at its discretion. And if we have concerns that the presence of a particular person on peer review uh, may be detrimental to the process, uh, we have a very low threshold to, to take an action about it. I think it's important to uh, keep in mind that allegations may or may not be substantiated. So um, in the case on the left, um, as has been reported in the press, uh, there was a, a detailed um, investigation that was conducted at the Whitehead Institute. And uh, that led to a series of, of findings. Um, the case on the right, uh, this was a, a person who had claimed um, that, uh, that she had been um, harassed. Uh, there was a litigation that uh, followed. Uh, and it then turned out that um, this particular person um, had uh, fabricated a particular professor at a university who um, had uh, died of, of COVID. Uh, and so this uh, definitely damaged uh, her credibility. Um, so an allegation may or may not be substantiated. Just because we have received an allegation doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. Um, and in fact, what we have seen is, is that most of the cases, um, we, uh, the allegations are, are not um, substantiated. I, I would point out that even though that is true, um, the, the substantiation rate that we're seeing is probably an underestimate, and I will explain why in, in, in just a bit. Okay, another area that we're dealing with um, are conferences. Uh, so NIH uh, offers what are called R13 or U13 grants. These are, are grants where uh, we help support a conference. Uh, and we have issued now a couple of guide notices uh, regarding our expectations for enhancing diversity and creating surf envi uh, safe environments um, in, uh, uh, at NIH supported uh, conferences. And uh, most recently, this is uh, almost literally hot off the press, um, this, uh, the, the blog came out on March the 2nd, a few days ago, um, and uh, the guide notice came out last month. Uh, we are now going to require that, um, uh, that uh, recipients of, uh, of NIH conference awards uh, have to provide us with a safety plan. And that safety plan um, will, be, uh, will be given to us uh, as part of what's called the just-in-time procedure. This is um, a procedure that we, where we ask for additional information before making a final decision as to whether or not to issue an award, uh, they will have to provide us with a safety plan. That safety plan will be reviewed by our staff, um, and that safety plan would have to be approved uh, before the award um, can be issued. So this is just starting, it, and it will start uh, for applications that are coming in, I believe, in April um, of, this, of this year. Um, GAO uh, did uh, an audit of, um, of sexual harassment in STEM research. Um, the title basically says that all agencies have taken action but, uh, but need um, better collaboration. And a specific recommendation that was made to NIH uh, was that we develop a, uh, a better collaboration with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights. Uh, and we have done that um, in September of 2020. Uh, we signed a memorandum of understanding. And, and one of the, the key aspects of this um, is that we share information with one another. They, they actually have access to, um, to our files. Uh, and, 
um, and we do communicate with each other um, on uh, specific cases. All right, the last part of the talk, I wanna go through some scenarios. So let me go through, this is the first scenario. All of these scenarios um, have been repeated uh, multiple times. So th this is what you might say from, uh, from the agency's point of view is the most ideal, which is that uh, we get a, a phone call uh, from, um, or we, a message uh, from a vice president for research who tells us that the, uh, an investigator violated um, the university's, uh, in this case, sexual misconduct policy. It could be any kind of misconduct policy. Um, and so then the vice president for research uh, proposes a management plan, which could include sanctions. And part of those sanctions include removing the individual from NIH grant activity. So the, the, uh, the university will say for a period of a year or two years, uh, this particular person will not be involved in NIH funded activities while a variety of corrective actions are, are being taken. Uh, we have that conversation. Uh, this is then followed by an official letter that documents the plan. Uh, we work with the university to make any necessary changes to uh, the principal um, investigator. We'll remove that particular person from peer review. So this is a, um, um, a relatively straightforward, from our point of view, it's, I'm sure it's not straightforward from the university's point of view, but it's a, a relatively straightforward type of scenario. All right, now here's a kind of scenario which is um, a lot less um, uh, straightforward. Uh, we receive some kind of a complaint. We might receive this complaint, for example, through um, our, web, our, our web form. It might be about sexual misconduct. It might be about some other form of, uh, of uh, workplace environment uh, misconduct. Uh, and we have not heard anything about this uh, previously. So then what we'll do is we'll contact the institution and we'll say, here's what we've heard and what's going on. The institution will come back to us and the institution will say, yeah, that's actually true. Um, there, there, was, there were complaints and we did an investigation. We didn't tell you about it uh, and we confirmed the finding, but don't worry NIH because we're, we're doing things about this. Uh, we're not going to allow uh, this particular investigator to, um, to supervise graduate students. Or we might not allow them to be with graduate with um, students or, or other personnel um, alone. They have to be um, chaperoned. Uh, but don't worry, um, they can go ahead and continue to function as a principal investigator on NIH funded work. There, there are no real restrictions there. So then at that point, uh, we then push back and we might say, well, wait a minute, if, if somebody is not trusted, um, to uh, serve as a graduate student advisor, especially if that was something that was written as part of the grant, um, then can we really say that the, uh, that the NIH funded work is being conducted in an environment which is safe and conducive to high quality uh, research? Uh, some of these conversations tend to be rather difficult. Um, and uh, then um, over time, the university might take a different tack on this and decide, you know what, that, that's right. The university will then replace the PI uh, during that period of time while, uh, while they're taking their own corrective um, actions. All right, now here's the third scenario. And th these, are, these are really difficult. Um, and this is where um, the institution will make some form of a tentative finding. Uh, that they will, they'll hear about a complaint. Uh, they will conduct an investigation. They will come up with a tentative finding, but they don't finalize it. And the tentative finding may be that, that there was a violation of, of uh, institutional rules. Um, so the scientists then will say, I'll make a deal with the university and resign. Um, in exchange for the investigation coming to an end, no formal finding being made. And uh, there may well be uh, what we call an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, uh, whereby the institution promises that it will not um, say anything. So the in investigation stops. The scientist in the meantime um, is uh, uh, offered a position from another institution that is completely oblivious to what's going on. And they may very well think that they've made an incredible coup and, and they've recruited some, some superstar. The first institution then submits to NIH what's called a relinquishing statement. So a relinquishing statement says, we in this institution um, have no further interest in this grant and um, we don't really care what happens to it. Uh, but it doesn't need to be by, uh, by us any longer. And then very shortly thereafter, we receive what's called a type seven application from the new institution. So a type seven application is a request uh, to move an NIH grant uh, from one institution to another. Now, this is a big problem because what it essentially means is that 
the rogue is being passed from one institution to another. Uh, and we NIH um, are effectively being uh, uh, made uh, accomplices, you, you know, unwilling accomplices or unwitting accomplices. And so these are the kinds of cases that um, can get to be very messy. Um, and we do try to work with institutions um, to figure out ways to um, prevent this kind of thing. There, there are a number of challenges um, that we face. Um, in some cases, the cases are not linked to NIH funded activities or NIH funded organizations, and then there's less that we can do. It is really important to keep in mind that scientists are not NIH employees. They are the employees of the institutions. We do not give grants to individual scientists. We give grants to institutions. The institutions in turn are responsible for overseeing their employees. And that means that our, um, our oversight here um, is indirect um, because uh, we, we cannot take actions against specific scientists the same way we could take actions against, say, an intramural scientist who's one of our own um, employee, uh, employees. Okay. And the third problem is premature closure of misconduct investigations. This is where you know, deals are made or a scientist agrees to move from one institution to another. Uh, this is also related to uh, problems related to litigation and non disclosure agreements. Uh, and so uh, here, what, what we have um, is that um, be, because of the fact that there's no formal finding or because of the non-disclosure agreement, um, our ability to, uh, to deal with these cases effectively uh, may be uh, compromised. Um, we have dealt with a number of cases that um, do not reflect bullying or retaliation or a hostile work environment. Uh, but rather reflect uh, more standard employee, employer, employee disputes. Uh, a classic example, I would say, or actually maybe not classic, a typical example is a uh, promotion. Somebody doesn't get a promotion and they allege that the reason why they didn't get the promotion is because of some form of discrimination. Uh, and uh, it may be that the reason why they didn't get promotion is because um, their scientific output as objectively measured just hasn't been all that good. Um, or, or there may be any of a variety of other, other things going on that do not constitute harassment, bullying, or discrimination, but rather um, constitute um, more uh, standard, un unfortunate uh, employer-employee disputes. Um, another concern is that the allegations may be non-specific. I gave the example of um, where we get an allegation that Dr. Jones is a jerk. Um, there's just so much we can do with that. And finally, um, the caseload is quite heavy. As you can see, we're, you know, we're getting 160 of these a year. We do have staff um, who, who work on these, uh, but um, although the, the way I've presented it to you sounds very clean, um, these cases are, are really messy and some of them take up um, an enormous amount um, of staff um, time. Um, so we have um, uh, developed, so let me just summarize here. Uh, we have developed and implemented that parallel process, which was recommended to us by the uh, working group of the advisory committee to the director. Um, we have um, uh, now uh, amassed a, a fair amount of experience. We've handled uh, now well over 400 cases. It's a mix of sexual harassment and other kinds of harassment. Uh, we've taken steps to address um, harassment at conferences. And, and now thinking ahead, uh, we are thinking about ways in which we can strengthen our relationship with uh, the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, we have a very strong relationship with the Office of Civil Rights, but it's rather how can we you know, synergize our, our work um, to a, a higher level than we have before? Uh, how can we strengthen the remedies that are available um, at our disposal, keeping in mind that uh, the scientists are not our employees and, and our authorities only allow us to go um, so far? Uh, spreading the message that harassment is not tolerated. We, we have a, a, a tagline at NIH that harassment is not tolerated here. Uh, we, we want to uh, spread that, um, that tagline to harassment is not tolerated within um, the extramural um, research environment. Um, and uh, we're dealing with a wide variety of types of misconduct. And I think that very much reflects the theme of your meeting. Um, it's, it's, uh, we started this with a focus on sexual harassment. That was the primary focus. Uh, but uh, as time has gone on, uh, we, we've come to realize that the problems, sexual harassment is extremely serious, but we're dealing with a number of other serious problems as well, um, including um, other, other forms of, of uh, issues with the, um, with the workplace environment. Um, I, I've had the, the blessing to work with a number 
of really wonderful people. Um, I would like to particularly point out Larry Tabak. Larry Tabak is now the acting director um, of, uh, of NIH, and he was previously the uh, principal deputy director uh, of NIH. He, he is my supervisor. Uh, he has been um, enormously um, supportive um, in this effort, um, and in, particularly, uh, in particular has backed us up uh, when we um, have found ourselves in, in difficult situations or challenging situations. Uh, he strongly supports uh, this idea uh, that we need to do everything we possibly can to assure that the, uh, that the biomedical research uh, workspace is one that is safe, uh, healthful, and conducive to uh, high quality research. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, and I'm happy to um, your questions or comments.